everyone, welcome back to Biology or Biology or welcome if you're new to this channel, the channel where we basically talk about everything biology. This is the first official video where we're going to be talking about biology after my first kind of like intro video. Definitely subscribe, like this video if you enjoy it. Today's topic of the video is cancer and we're basically going to be asking the question, will we ever cure cancer? Now that is a really bold question to ask, I know, but we're going to sit here and we're going to have a discussion about this question because I think it is a really interesting question to ask and it's a question that a lot of people want the answer to. I myself, ever since I got really interested in cancer, cancer biology have asked this question and I'm like why isn't there a cure for cancer yet? You know cancer has been around for a really long time. We find evidence of cancer in like the dinosaur record and in fossilized human bone. You know cancer has been around for a really long time so it only seems logical to ask why haven't we found a cure for cancer yet? We have lots of different types of therapies but we don't have a single cure. So essentially yeah in this video we're going to be tackling this question. It's a very complex question and we're just going to be discussing some of the reasons why it is so incredibly difficult to cure cancer. Before we get into the reasons as to why it is difficult to cure cancer, we are firstly going to look at benign tumours. I think this is really important to understand first of all because a benign tumour, when we say something is benign as opposed to malignant, that is technically not cancer and a benign tumour is curable through surgery. Because a benign tumour is by definition a tumour that has not spread, it is growing locally and it hasn't like locally invaded the surrounding tissue so we can simply cut it out with surgery and it has been cured. A malignant tumour is one that has the potential to spread by the process of metastasis and when you reach that stage a malignant tumour is by definition now cancer. So yeah I just wanted to talk about that first of all because a benign tumour isn't cancer, but it is curable. And so we're going to be obviously focusing on malignant tumours, which are technically cancer because they have the potential to spread around the body. They may have already spread around the body by metastasis and formed secondary tumours in distant sites around the body. With that addressed, we're now going to move on to look at some of the reasons as to why it's difficult to cure cancer. I have three main reasons that we're going to discuss. There are obviously more. The first reason that we're going to talk about is essentially cancer is not a single disease. Can Cancer is a collection of yes related diseases but it's not one single disease it never has been and we can look at this on lots of different scales. So first of all, if we look at cancer by kind of anatomical site, Cancer Research UK and the NHS, so the National Health Service in the UK, they define over 200 types of cancer by kind of anatomical site. That's like breast cancer, lung cancer, prostate cancer, glioblastoma, there are loads of different types of tumours, malignant tumours, cancers. But on top of that, we have lots of different subtypes of cancer. So if we take one, for example, which is quite a good example to illustrate this, ovarian cancer. Ovarian cancer can be derived from quite a few different cell types and so we have different subtypes of ovarian cancer. For example it can be derived from an epithelial cell type, it can come from a germ cell and then within those subtypes we have different histologies meaning how it looks under a microscope. So within the epithelial ovarian cancers for example it can be of an endometrioid histology or a clear cell histology or a mucinoid histology, serous, there are lots of different types basically. So ovarian cancer itself is lots of different cancers. So we have different cancers by anatomy. We then have different types of tumours in one location. And then we're going to keep pushing this because as I said, cancer is really heterogeneous and diverse. So if we look at two individuals with the same type of cancer, say individual A has an epithelial ovarian clear cell tumour and individual B also has an epithelial ovarian clear cell tumour, they will be very different. They're not going to be identical. And that's kind of like the rationale for personalized medicine or precision medicine because individual A and individual B, they don't have the same tumor, even though they're both epithelial ovarian clear cell tumors, they're both different. And so if we use the same treatment for both of them, it's quite likely that they're going to respond differently. And so that is the reasoning behind the development of personalized medicines, you know, treating individuals one at a time. Obviously personalised medicine that has a lot of issues associated with it, the first that comes to mind is the increased cost of treating every single person individually. But we're going to keep pushing this further because we're going to zoom into a single tumour in one individual. All of those cancer cells that make up that tumour, because a tumour is essentially a growing mass of cells, all of those cells are going to look very different and that 
is what we call intratumor heterogeneity, ITH basically. And you know, this ITH, this intratumor heterogeneity has created so many issues when it comes to, you know, understanding cancer and treating cancer because they're just so diverse. Most of the cells within the tumor are very different. And this heterogeneity exists in both time and space. So with regards to like spatial ITH, spatial intratumor heterogeneity, it's such a mouthful. If we take a single biopsy from a tumor, say if this is our tumor and I take a biopsy, from here and then I take a biopsy from the other side you know they're gonna look different and so if we just took a single biopsy that's unlikely to be representative of the whole tumor it's going to be biased because as I said there's diversity all within this 3D tumor and a single biopsy can't account for all of that diversity. Secondly, as I said, intratumor heterogeneity can exist in time. The cancer will be evolving through time and that's the next thing we're going to talk about basically. It's the next reason we're going to move on to as to why it's difficult to cure cancer. But just to summarize this point, the first reason as to why it's so difficult to cure cancer is because cancer is not a single disease. It's never been a single disease and never will be. Yes, there are commonalities between all cancers. It's what we call the hallmarks of cancer, but that is in some respects an oversimplification because every single tumor and in fact, every single tumor or cancer cell is different. And so if you think about that, it becomes almost an impossible task to find a single cure. So as I said, reason number two as to why it's difficult to cure cancer is essentially because cancer is an evolving disease. Cancer evolves and changes and it's what we call a moving target. In 1976, a person called Peter Noel, Noel, I can never pronounce things correctly. You're going to have to get used to on this channel. We're not pronouncing things correctly, but a person called Peter Noel published a paper that talks about cancer as an evolutionary disease and that was kind of like a landmark study and we now know that cancer is yes an evolutionary disease it evolves so everyone has heard of evolution you know evolution describing change or changes over time and obviously a lot of people have therefore heard of natural selection which is a key mechanism of evolution it was first described by charles darwin and we mostly think about natural selection in the context of like ecology but cancer evolves and cancer evolves by natural selection. So it is pivotal to our understanding of cancer nowadays. Cancer is constantly evolving by natural selection and these cancer cells, these different cancer cells in a tumor mass, as we've talked about, they are all competing and it's this constant, you know, survival of the fittest that is taking place. And that is what we mean by cancer as a moving target. And we're not therefore trying to treat just one thing. It's like moving all over the place. And that's what makes it really difficult for us to treat. You imagine someone holding a dartboard up and like moving it around and you trying to aim. Like that's basically what's going on. Cancer is constantly changing. It's always going to be like one step ahead of the game, which is really frustrating. Putting this into the context of therapy, for example, we have a tumor mass, okay, a mass of these cancer cells, and they're all different, as we've talked about. There is huge variation. If we use a treatment, and that treatment manages to kill every single cell except one, because that one single surviving cell is resistant to the treatment that we're using. That cell has a particular characteristic, which means it doesn't get killed by the therapy. Maybe it's chemotherapy that we're using, but it survives, okay? It survives, the rest is gone. And so according to the theory of natural selection, you know, this single cell, this single cancer clone is going to have a competitive advantage. It's going to be able to grow and repopulate that tumor. And so it basically will seed a relapse. That tumor is gone initially, but it will regrow because there was this cell or perhaps a group of cells maybe that were resistant to the treatment. And now it might be of a very different composition to that original tumor because it was derived from this single cell that may have had different characteristics, different properties, the selection pressures that are applied. And yeah, it is moving, it's evolving all the time. Importantly, in that situation now with a tumor that was eradicated, but has relapsed, that tumor now is probably going to have to be treated with a different therapy. It might have to be a different chemotherapy if we've used chemotherapy initially, or it might have to be a different modality entirely, like radiotherapy, for example, or immunotherapy. But essentially it's just resistant now to that original treatment. So we can't use that anymore. We have to try something else. We have to try targeting the tumor from a different angle, but the whole process is gonna be repeated again. You know, you're going to maybe use radiotherapy, you'll get rid of most of the tumor, but again, you might have a few remaining cells that survive and 
seed further growth you know it's this ongoing battle so moving on to the third reason that we're going to talk about and discuss basically cancer is derived from self so it's simply our normal body cells that have gone completely awry they are entirely dysregulated but they have come from ourselves all these once normal biological processes have become dysregulated whether that was cell proliferation or cell growth or cellular metabolism like all of those processes are now dysregulated in a cancer cell it's not as if cancer has derived from entirely new and novel processes and so when we're treating cancer what we are trying to do is restore something that was once normal it's not as if we're trying to tackle and treat entirely new processes as i said we're trying to restore normality and that's a lot harder to do you know if we had these entirely new mechanisms that is what we'd be targeting, but we're not. We're targeting normal processes. We're just trying to make it normal again. So when we have this tumor and we have a therapy that we're going to try and use against this tumor, what we're trying to do is only target those tumor cells, not the normal body cells, because otherwise there would be toxicity associated with that therapy. You know, there would be a lot of side effects. So yeah, we're trying to identify a process that is only seen in a tumor cell and not in normal cells. Or we're trying to identify a particular molecule or protein that's only expressed in a cancer cell and not a normal cell. But that is really difficult to do because as i said these cancer cells they are derived from self so they're still going to have self characteristics it's just that they're entirely dysregulated we can basically contrast this with say for example a bacterial infection a bacterial cell is very different to a human cell and so most antibiotics which we use against bacterial infections a lot of them basically inhibit the synthesis of a bacterial cell wall so if we inhibit the synthesis of that cell wall then we are selectively targeting the bacterial cells because our human cells or animal cells we first of all don't have a cell wall and so there's not going to be any associated toxicity when we use an antibiotic and so yeah jumping back to cancer as i said it's very hard to find those qualitative differences between a cancer cell and a normal cell they're very difficult to identify there are some rare examples but they are just quite difficult to come by there is this phrase a magic bullet and that was first stated or coined by a person called Paul Ehrlich a like Paul Ehrlich we're gonna go with that okay he coined the term magic bullet and what he meant by that was you know we're trying to target something that's only present in the cancer cell and not the normal cell but as I said we don't have a lot of those to target and so yeah there's always going to be some level of toxicity and so we're always going to be restricted by the dose we can use because if we had a therapy that only targeted tumor cells then you'd be able to use a higher dose because it wouldn't be targeting normal cells alongside and so there wouldn't be any side effects if you're using a therapy that targets both the tumor cell and normal cells you're going to be limited by the dose you can use because a dose that's too high is going to target a lot of normal cells and the toxicities may even be life-threatening so you can't do that you're limited in that respect and that's what we call the therapeutic window as a really good example of this chemotherapy is targeting a quantitative difference between a cancer cell or a tumor cell and a normal cell chemotherapy is basically targeting cells that divide really quite rapidly or more often or when they shouldn't do and now cancer cells they are entirely dysregulated in their proliferation so everything to do with cancer is basically dysregulated but here we're talking about how often they divide it's not that they necessarily divide faster than normal cells it's just that they divide when they shouldn't do and so they're dividing out of control and yes therefore more often than they should do and so chemotherapy is targeting that quantitative difference between a tumor cell and a normal cell and that is essentially what chemotherapy exploits but you know everyone is familiar with the side effects of chemotherapy you know it causes hair loss it causes anemia it causes extreme fatigue and people often get lots of infections and that is because chemotherapy as i said it targets cells that divide quite rapidly or when they shouldn't do or more often than say a normal cell and so if we look at the body tissues that divide naturally quite rapidly that's like your gastrointestinal tract that's like your skin cells that's like the cells in your bone marrow that lead to the production of red blood cells and white blood cells and a lot of those side effects are because it's targeting the normal tissues that naturally divide quite rapidly so if we just look at the bone marrow for example the bone marrow leads to the production of red blood cells and white blood cells the red blood cells they carry oxygen 
around the body and so if we have less red blood cells that's going to cause anemia and then if we have less white blood cells the cells of our immune system then obviously we're going to have more frequent infections because we can't defend ourselves as well so that is the reason as to why chemotherapy leads to so many side effects because we're not selectively targeting the tumor cell we're mostly targeting the tumor cell but it always is going to target other normal body cells and so it's going to lead to associated toxicity and as i said before that means the dose of chemotherapy can never be higher because if we use the higher dose the side effects would not be clinically manageable at all okay so those are the three reasons i wanted to talk about today obviously as i said at the start this question is huge and yeah i hope you followed the majority of that and you found it interesting i most importantly wanted to say that although it does sound quite pessimistic and daunting you know there are lots of reasons as to why it's hard to cure cancer like are we ever gonna cure cancer i want to end on a positive note like i'm adamant that we're ending optimistically okay looking ahead to the future it does look good you know we're constantly improving the therapies that we can use against cancer they will continue to evolve right cancer is evolving but our therapies are also evolving and there are other ways in which we can think about cancer you know we can think about prevention as well as cure it's just as important if not more important than curing cancer if you can prevent cancer in the first place then you don't even need a cure but anyway that's a whole other story in itself definitely like this video if you enjoyed it comment down below subscribe to the channel if you're new and if you want to stick around to learn biology with us with me and yeah definitely turn the notification bell on as well so you know when i upload thank you for being here thank you for learning biology with biology and i will speak to you in another video